You're listening to Kingdom Living with our teacher, Mark Byers of Calvary Christian Church of Royal Oak, Michigan. Pastor Mark is continuing his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. So let's join him now. God comes to Egypt and Pharaoh's there and he's a wicked king and he's got a wicked nation. And he says, Pharaoh, I'm sending my servant Moses to you and I'm telling you, let my people go. Let them out of the earth. Let them out of Egypt. Pharaoh says, no way. God says, okay. You don't want to let him go? I'm going to send the plague. So he sends plagues. So he goes back in, tells him, let him go. No, not going to let him go. Send some more plagues. Let him go. No, not going to let him go. Send some more plagues. Why does God do that? Why would God be so patient? Why didn't he just go into Pharaoh and say, let my children go? Nope. (laughs) Pharaoh, you're dead. Come on, we're leaving. Why didn't he just kill him? He did anyway. He, He crushed Egypt. Over the next weeks or months, however it was, it wasn't just a couple days. It was a number of days when you read the context. It had to be at least weeks. When he was done with Egypt, he had crushed the glory of Egypt. And Pharaoh and his army was dead. Why didn't he just do it right away? That's the way I'd have done it. That's the way you'd have done it too. You know why? Because our ways aren't his ways. You know what he was doing? He was trying to give the Egyptians space to repent. Just like he's going to do at the end of the age. I want to get this out. Oh, Lord, help me. Dear ones, he comes to Egypt and he starts pouring out these plagues. And when he's done, how many of you have ever noticed that when the children of Israel left Egypt, there was a company of people called the mixed multitude. There was a whole host of people who saw God manifested so clearly in those plagues and the preservation of Israel that he was able to convince a whole host of people who were not Israelites to join up. And he was able to save them from the destruction of being under a wicked government with wicked religion. Do you know why he does it? Because the Lord tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, that he is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, forgiving, compassionate. He doesn't want to destroy the world. He doesn't want to judge the wicked. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He does everything to get them to turn. And so he gives them space to repent. So he starts pouring out one judgment after another judgment, after another judgment, after another judgment, after another judgment. And finally, when he realizes they're not going to repent, he judges them. But every hungry heart in Egypt saw God and recognized that it was God, said, Israel, we're going with you. At the end of the age, in the book of Revelation, he does exactly the same thing. He's going to pour out his wrath in the nations, not on us, on the nations. And here's some verses. Listen to this. Revelation 2, 21. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Revelation 3, 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. He's warning them. Watch. I'm going to come as a thief. Get ready. I'm giving you space to repent. Revelation 9, 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither see nor hear nor walk. He says that even after the plagues, they wouldn't repent. In Revelation 16, 9. And men were scorched with great heat, just like in the book of Exodus, and blasphemed the name of God. Now listen. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. God is the one controlling the plagues. And what is he trying to do? The same thing he did in Egypt. He's trying to gather men who will repent. And they repented not to give him glory. 
Revelation 16, 11, And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. Why does God pour out plagues in the last day in the wicked? Not to destroy them, but to make it so uncomfortable. They'll literally run to God. But they're so evil they won't. Just like Pharaoh and much of Egypt. But there's going to be a company of people who do run to God. There's going to be a company of people who say, Oh, I see God in these plagues. God is pouring out judgment. How many of you realize right now, all you got to do is go to your office or your shop and have a discussion with somebody and say, yeah, well, well, that flood out west, that was the judgment of God. You know what you're going to get? Really? Or, don't give me that! You're going to get two responses. One is going to be, you think so? And the other one is going to be, I don't want to hear it! Because there's only two classes of people. Those who want the truth and those who hate the truth. And when God starts pouring out the plagues in the last days that are in his hand, that are in his power, and his people are being preserved from those plagues because they're his people, he's going to be pouring out wrath. And then if whatever we suffer, we're taking it joyfully and we're rejoicing in God, anybody who has a heart for God is going to see our lives. Christ will be shining forth like he never has and there will be a harvest of souls for the kingdom at the end of the age. To the church of Thyatira, there was sin in the church, and the Lord says, I'm giving her time to repent. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, and God will forgive you and me for every sin we repent of. We have been saved from his wrath through the blood of Christ. We can come and hide under the shadow of the Almighty. But listen, this is a lifelong observation. I've been serving the Lord since I was a child, and I have seen hundreds and literally thousands of Christians because I've been involved in Christian work all my life, even as a child. I don't know if you know this, I was called the children's church pastor at 12. It was in the Daily Tribune with my picture because they knew I had a call in my life. I've been involved in church work since I was a child. I have seen thousands of Christians, and I have seen this fact. When trouble, tribulation, pressure, corrections, disciplines, whatever God sends your way comes, you will either become bitter or better, and there's no in-between. No in-between. You either get on an escalator up by thankfulness, or you get on an escalator down with bitterness. And you either become better or bitter. And you're the only one who can make the decision. I can't make it for you. Oh, I wish I could. But I can't. Doesn't work that way. God has given everybody here a free choice. You will either become bitter or better at the troubles you face. God's ordained purpose is to bring forth the life of Christ in your vessel. He's going to send trouble. You know, there was a day Abraham came to his servant, he said, Eliezer, Isaac needs a wife. I want you to go find a wife from my family and my kindred. Don't take one from these Canaanites. Don't take a wife from these vile people. In that story, I'm not going to go into all the details. I just want to say this and quickly in passing. Abraham's a type of the father. Isaac is a type of the son. And Eliezer is a type of the Holy Spirit. That's clear in Scripture. Abraham, the father, sends the Holy Spirit to find a bride for his son. That's exactly what happens in the New Testament. The father sends the Holy Spirit to find a bride for Jesus. And so Eliezer goes out, and he goes to the land of Abraham, and he comes to a well, and he begins to pray, and he said, Lord, make my journey prosperous for my master Abraham. I'm going to ask you this sign. The first woman that comes here that I ask to give me a drink of water and offers to give a drink to my camels, she's the one. Now, the Bible tells us he had ten camels. Do you know how many gallons of water a camel can drink? Fifty to sixty each. Fifty to sixty gallons of water. He had ten of them. He was asking this young lady to fill up a swimming pool with a bucket. <laughs> what a test. 
And she had to offer to do it. He wasn't going to ask her. So Rebecca comes and he says, could you give me a drink? She says, sure. And let me water your camels too. And he looks up and says, oh God, you've prospered my journey. This is the one. So he goes home and sees her father. He says, can she come with me? And he says, yeah. Let's turn there. I've got to give you this word. This is something from heaven, if you can hear me today. Genesis chapter 24. I want to see the glorious things that happen. In verse 44, she says to him, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. That's what he's asking to do. And, of course, she does it. And so he goes home to her father Laban and says, Can she come with me? And they call Rebecca in verse 58. They called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebecca and her sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands and ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Then Rebecca and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels. It's amazing how often these camels are mentioned in this story. Constantly brought up. The camels, the camels, the camels. Drink the water. If she asks to water the camels, and she waters the camels, and he has the camels, and then he says... Rebecca and her maids arose and they rode on the camels and they followed the man. Have you ever ridden a camel? I have. Very short distance. I don't like riding horses, but a camel is much worse. I mean, a camel is like getting beat up. You know, you just, you know, a camel is obnoxious as can be. When we were in Bible school, there was a kid and he was obnoxious. And we went to a zoo on a Bible college uh, day off. We all went to this big park, and, and there were camels there. And this guy got up to the, the fence, and there was a fence, and the camel was right here. And this guy got in the camel's face, and he was being obnoxious, saying things to the camel, and mocking this camel. And the camel just went, <laughs> and literally spit all over his face. I mean, what a gob of spit just running down his face. <laughs> and we were all like, <laughs> he got it. You know, it was like, wow. But they're an obnoxious lot. They really are. And she, giving those camels water must have been a chore, an unbelievable chore. And then she has to ride them. And so it says she rides them. And in verse 63, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening and he lifted up his eyes and looked. And there, the camels were coming. Not Rebecca. Not his wife. The camels are coming. Look, the camels are coming. So, the camels were carrying something. The bride. And I think it's significant, the Bible says there was ten of them. Because when God led Israel out of Egypt, as we saw in Sunday school, he led them out of Egypt on the back of ten trials. Ten trials. Your trials are camels designed by God to carry you to the beloved and to get you ready for the wedding. But we're living in such a Laodicean church that is rich and increased with goods and in thinking they need nothing, not knowing they're poor and wretched and blind and naked, they don't need the camels, we'll fly. We don't need trials, we're out of here. The whole basis of that is an arrogance that says we don't need any change. We're ready for the bride now. And he looks and says, oh, ready? You think you're rich and increased with goods and need of nothing and ready for the wedding. And you are filled with putrefying sores. You're poor and wretched and blind and naked and you don't know it. And you think you've got the glory, but you don't. And I can't even marry you in your condition. You need the camels. You need the trials. You need the tribulations, the persecutions, the troubles. And God in his great mercy doesn't want anyone to miss the wedding. So what's he going to do? He's going to pour out tribulation in the last day and get his church ready. Because we aren't ready. Gorgie Vins, the Baptist man of God that spent 13 years in a Soviet prison for the cause of Christ. 
following his father who also had spent many a year in Soviet prisons for the cause of Christ. Gorgie Vins came to the United States and he was, I went to see him. It was an amazing experience. Fifty men were on the platform and I and my wife didn't have any idea who Gorgie Vins was. And we said, let's see if we can pick out the man who's got a countenance of glory. And one man out of the 50 had it and he was Gorgie Vins. We could pick him out of 50 pastors. All of the same nationality, dressed the same way. His face radiated with the glory of God. And he stood up and he said in the Soviet prisons, there are no Baptists or Pentecostals, just Christians. He's seen men get up and take beatings for other men who were so weak that it would have killed them to accept it. Just because they loved their brothers and they weren't the same denomination. Church is all divided up and broken up and splintered up and we're standing here saying, we're ready for the rapture. And God says, no, you're not. But I'm going to send something that will get you ready. And so when Gorgie Vins got up to the platform to speak, he was speaking through an interpreter. And, and this one American man who was of the same nationality but had been raised apparently in the U.S. And he, he got up and he says, and, and it was an astonishing display of arrogance. He got up and he was, he was the big shot in the meeting introducing Gorgie Vins. And I, I, I was grieved to think that man was the man introducing him. And he stood up and says... Well, Brother Vins, now that you've been in the United States of America for a number of years, what do you think of the American Christians? And Gorgie Vins looked at him with a broken and contrite heart and grieving eyes and said, I'd rather not answer that question. Then he said, what do you think of American hot dogs? And Gorgie Vins says, oh, they're okay. And then when he began to speak without the interference of that man, life began to flow to that congregation from a man who had the glory of God in an earthen vessel. He didn't want to go to that prison. He said, my father's God became my God and my father's prison became my prison. He suffered intensely. But when he was set free in the vessel, in that clay pot, in that styrofoam cup, the glory showed on his face. The outshining of Gorgie Vin's life was so clear that you could pick him out of 50 men. Brothers and sisters, we don't need just a simple adjustment to our lives. We need a complete overhaul. And the trials that you go through now, every one of you, and you, listen, you have trials. You don't have to go to Soviet communist country like, uh, like China to suffer. There are some of you right now suffering intense persecution from loved ones. Intense persecution from the pressures of the world. We have to overcome. We're going to see in the book of Revelation, all those seven churches had different characteristics and they all had to overcome in their specific area. In the United States, we are like the Laodicean church, rich and increased with goods, and we've got to overcome here too. There's got to be people who overcome in the middle of wealth. And it's a trial to not submit to the pressure of worldliness in the United States. It's a pressure not to become seeker friendly. As a pastor, I look around and I, you know, our bills are met. We pay our bills, we pay our staff, and God provides enough for us to do what we do here. But I look at churches around this city who didn't even exist 15 years ago and they've got 10 million and 20 million dollar pieces of property. One church just bought 80 acres and they're building a huge, humongous church and what they've done is they've decided to be seeker friendly. Money galore, anything they want. And we have to pray in our finances to make sure that we pay our salaries every week. And I know when I preach, I chase people away. And I know when we worship, people get up and walk out of our church as they did just two weeks ago. Because we're obnoxious. It doesn't matter that we're biblical, we're obnoxious. They're, they're like Saul's daughter, Michael, David's wife, mocks us because we worship the way the Spirit tells us to do it in the Scripture. We suffer. The question is, are we willing to suffer right up to the end and endure unto the end that we might have the glory of God in these earthen vessels? 
or you can fight it, you can kick against it, you can resist it. I want you to know, Paul said, there's an eternal weight of glory waiting for someone who will let God put him in the midst of fire. He has saved me from a life of eternal misery. I want to embrace his purpose for that eternal place. And I guarantee you there's going to be a day when those who embrace the cross, embrace the troubles, embrace the fire, and don't let the fire make them smell like smoke, and they come out better instead of bitter, that they're going to shine like stars in the glory of God's kingdom. And those who reject it will be there, saved, yes, they'll be there, but they will find out what they decided to miss because of their carnal choice. God help us. The Lord Jesus is looking for a bride. And he has sent camels to carry us to him. A.W. Tozer said it this way. One of the most profound sentences I've ever read in my life in any book. He said, God can't use a man greatly until he has wounded him deeply. It is the troubles, the tribulations, the trials that qualify us to be used of God in a wonderful way. May we, like the scripture says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And that is right in the middle of the book of Revelation. We're not getting out. We're going to be purified by fire. And by God's grace, the only thing that will burn away is the ropes that bind us. And we'll come out not smelling even like smoke. But you can come out smelling like smoke. And let me tell you, if you do, everybody around you will know you're bitter except you. I was bitter once. Somebody said, you're bitter. I said, I'm not bitter. They said, by the way you even answered me, I know you are. I'm not bitter. If you're not embracing the fire, you're getting bitter. And it'll be seen by everybody ultimately. God is going to purge his threshing floor. He's going to separate the chaff from the wheat and the way that happens is they just take the wheat and they throw it in the air and the wind blows the weak light chaff to the side and the pure wheat falls down and then the winning wing man throws it in the air again and the wind blows the chaff away and allows the grain to settle and the way they separate wheat from chaff in Israel in the old days they would just throw the wheat into the air and God's going to take the church and he's going to begin throwing us into the air for a three and a half year period and in that period the winds of adversity are going to be blowing and as they blow the chaff in the church is going to be driven away and what's left is going to be fine flour for the nations Let's stand this morning. Oh, Father, we are flesh and you know it. You know that we're but dust. And Father, there's nothing in us except Jesus that can glorify your name. There's nothing beautiful or attractive about us except the glory of God in us. Every other beauty and every other attractive thing about us fades with life and years. But the beauty of Jesus only gets richer and fuller and clearer and better. You're looking for a people who will show forth your glory to the nations. You're looking for a people who will endure unto the end that you can entrust the nations and the government of the nations to. We realize that we're not ready. But we realize we need the winds of adversity. We need the stirring up of the winnowing fork of our God. And we need the purging of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. We need the camels to carry us to our bridegroom. I'm asking you in Jesus' name to put such an anointing upon this congregation of people that we will be willing to face the fire and not end up being filled with the smell of smoke offensive and obnoxious to those around us, but may we be filled with the fragrance of Christ. May the life of Jesus be made manifest in these mortal bodies. 
that Jesus Christ might be exalted and people drawn to our God like the mixed multitude in Egypt to Israel. May our lives be a praise to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome you to Kingdom Living with Pastor Mark Byers. Let's get right to today's message as Pastor Mark continues his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. Jeremiah said in chapter 1, verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. I want you to notice that when God sent Jeremiah to Israel, to the nations in fact, he's saying to him, and obviously this is applicable to the Lord Jesus Christ, more than even Jeremiah by far. The Lord has to root out, pull down, destroy, and throw down before he can build and plant. We are looking at the doctrine of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I believe that there have been people through the historical church who have clearly understood the events of the second coming. It has only been in the recent 150 years that there's been a major distortion on this doctrine. And we have already looked at that distortion in part. And I feel like I have to tear down some concepts before I can build the right ones. You have to understand there are many people who are hearing these words who are very convinced that they have a real handle on end times. And they have their inferences and their little verses that they quote. And they have been taught these things even as I was taught them when I was young as well. And there are seven major inferences that are all put together in the normal dispensational teaching that originated with John Darby and the Brethren and has been spread through Schofield's Reference Bible and now is accepted so easily by churches and Christians around the world. There are seven concepts that they have, and I believe I have to spend the time to tear those seven down so that there will be ears to hear the possibility that maybe they need to reevaluate what they believe. We already looked at the first one, and that is that the tribulation is an outpouring of wrath, and Christians will never experience the wrath of God. We've already dealt with that and shown that the verses they use for that are literally lifted out of context, given meaning that the context doesn't apply to them, and twisted and used as an inference to support a doctrine that you would never have found in those verses if you didn't already have it in your mind through teaching. And then there are six more. The absence of the word church in the tribulation passages, such as Matthew 24 and Revelation chapters 4 through 18, is taken to prove that the church will not be on the earth. We're going to look at that this morning. A third one. That the emphasis on comfort and encouragement found in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that we are to comfort one another with the words of the second coming, literally have little or no effect if in fact we are going to have to face the worst days in the history of the world just before the coming. We are going to look at that, the Lord willing, today too. The other four are statements concerning the Lord coming soon or quickly. I would have liked to have had that this morning, but that's not possible. A second one, statements about the surprise that he's coming as a thief in the night so that he could come at any moment, at any second, the Lord could show up. Then there's the different Greek words that are used to describe his return. There are six different words used, three primary ones. We will look at those to see that they are not referring to two different events, but they are all referring to the same event. And scripture doesn't allow for such an interpretation being that they apply to two separate events, a coming before the rapture and then a, a revelation of himself after 
a secret rapture and then a revelation of himself. And then the seventh one, the expectation of the early church that he would come back at any time is taught. We're going to look at all seven of these. However, today I want to look at the two that I mentioned. I want to look at the fact that the absence of the word church in the tribulation passages is taken to mean that the church will not be here. And the second one that we will look at is the fact that there is comfort given and there's very little comfort if we are going through the tribulation. I would suspect that the weakest argument that is presented is the fact that the word church is lacking or missing. The literal word church is missing in the book of Revelation chapter 4 through 18 and in scriptures such as Matthew 24. I would, uh, it's a weak argument, but it has to be answered because it's used and considered so powerful by many. One of the things that I would like to just point out is the fact is that the word church is mentioned in Revelation chapter 1 through chapter 3 to the very end. It's in fact, the first three chapters are chapters written to the seven churches of Asia that existed in those days that we will look at individually in their message in the book of Revelation when we get to that. But the word church is from a Greek word, ecclesia, and it is not used. That word, that Greek word, ecclesia, is not used once in the book of Revelation after chapter 4. Now, Schofield, he writes this. This call seems clearly to indicate the fulfillment in, uh, let, let me say this, let me back up. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says that the Lord spoke to John and said this. After this, after chapter 3, after the three chapters dealing with the church, the Bible says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking to me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. I'm not sure you're all aware of this, but you need to be, that that verse is interpreted to mean the rapture. I would like to challenge anybody to read that verse and come up with the rapture if you weren't primed to believe in one. This was written to John. John is there being given revelation concerning the church and God's purpose. And he says, after he had spoken to him, write seven letters, specific letters, to seven specific churches that were dwelling in Asia Minor, which is actually Turkey today. And those seven churches received a specific message, and the message of each church did not apply to the other churches. And we'll see that very clearly later. But let me just say this. There were two churches who did not have anything negative spoken about them. There were five churches that did have things negative spoken about them. And the differences between the five, there were some severe things and some less severe things spoken. So one letter was not applicable to all seven churches. Not one of the seven letters could have been sent to the other church and would it have applied. It only applied to the church it was sent to. Now, after the Lord had revealed these seven letters, he says to John, After this, I looked, and behold, and that word after this is afterward, hereafter, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, saying, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. That phrase, when the Lord said, Come up, and I will show you what will be hereafter, is interpreted to mean that that is removing the church from the world, and whatever happens in the book of Revelation after this verse is applied to the tribulation period after a secret rapture prior to the, the beginning of the tribulation. Schofield says this on page 1134, This call seems clearly to indicate the fulfillment of 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17, which is about the rapture. The word church does not again occur in the revelation till all is fulfilled. Schofield uses that verse as the rapture. Dr. Walvoord, who we've mentioned already in previous lessons or previous services, in his book, The Rapture Question, writes this. It is notable that in this extended portion of scripture, not one mention of the church, the body of Christ, is found. After the message to the seven churches in Asia, not one reference is found to the church, either by the name itself or by any other title, listen to this, peculiar to believers of this present age. I want you to understand what he's saying. He's saying that there is not a word used in the whole book of Revelation that applies to the church, either by the name itself or by any other title, peculiar to believers of this present age. There's no word used to describe 
the church throughout the book of Revelation. No other word is used. If you just stop for a moment, put that aside, just keep that in your mind. Because I want you to understand how utterly foolish and how nonsensical that statement is. And this man is the leading pre-tribulation rapture teacher in the U.S. in the past. He's now dead, but he has been one of the biggest promoters and was the chancellor of Dallas Theological Seminary. He has the boldness to say that there is not a single title or name given in the book of Revelation, past chapter 4, verse 1, that is used to describe the church. I have with me here that I'm going to include in the notes for those who get them. Every time the word saints is used in the New Testament, including the multiple times that the word saints is used in the book of Revelation. He literally wrote a book showing to prove his theology. He is so bent on his theology. He wrote a book to prove that everywhere in the New Testament the word saints is used, it applies to the Jews. But when you read the verses that I have listed here, you have to destroy the New Testament to even come close to believing such a nonsensical thought. To say that the church is not called saints in the New Testament is nothing short of idiocy. And that's a strong statement. But when you simply read the Bible and quit trying to force into your interpretation of the Bible your thoughts, you are left with no other conclusion that the word saints applies to the church throughout the whole Bible in the New Testament. And of course, as we've already looked, we've seen that the word saints applies to all the believers in the Messiah, Old or New Testament alike. Revelation chapter 4, verses 16, is the description or the outline of the events that are going to take place, those terrible days that are called the Great Tribulation. They come right before the second coming of Christ, which is listed in chapter 19 of Revelation. The words elect and saints are taken to apply to only Jews by those who interpret the Bible this way. Therefore, everything in Revelation chapter 4 through Revelation chapter 18 is applied to the natural Jewish people and is said to be all related to Jacob's trouble. Let me tell you this, that I personally believe that there is no doubt that Israel as a natural people in the Middle East is going to face the worst days they have ever faced very shortly. There's no question in my mind that the worst holocaust of the Jewish race is about to take place in the history of the world. That is going to happen. But let me assure you of this, that that is a distinct, separate reality from what the world is going to face as well in that time. And the Great Tribulation period is not isolated to just what happens to Israel. It absolutely is going to be a worldwide, there's going to be worldwide catastrophic events. During this time, Walvoord, Schofield, and others, they teach that the church is in heaven enjoying relief from all of this pressure that's coming upon the world. Those that believe this teaching make the assumption that when it says a door was opened in heaven and John was given an invitation from the island of Patmos to come up hither, they make the assumption that that is a symbolic reference to the rapture of the church and that it is taking the church out of the world. The only reason that verse is applied to a rapture is because the assumption is there has to be a rapture in Revelation. And because there isn't a pre-tribulation rapture mentioned anywhere through the book, they had to find a verse to hang their coat on. To hang their doctrine on. We clearly have the second coming of Christ revealed in chapter 19. But from chapter 1 right to chapter 19, there isn't a single reference to a pre-tribulation secret rapture anywhere in the book. And so they had to have somewhere in the end time book to tell it. So they reached in there and they found this one and they said, that's the rapture. John was given a personal invitation to ascend into heaven and come up hither and he was going to be shown truths. As I read to you, come up hither and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And it says, and immediately, listen to this, I was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit. Just in an aside, let me say this to you for your understanding, that it is also an additional common belief among pre-tribulation rapture people that nobody besides the 144,000 Jews that are sealed are going to be preserved during that period. 
The judgments of God come on everybody else who aren't sealed. The idea is that the great tribulation is called Jacob's trouble, and it doesn't have anything to do with the church. It's just simply going to deal with the Jews. The church is removed, and they're not mentioned, and so because they're not mentioned, according to this theology, they must not be there. And if the church is not mentioned, they must be absent, or else they would have to have been sealed, and they aren't sealed. Now let me just reduce their whole argument to one sentence, and then we're going to dissect it. This argument can be reduced to the reasoning that where the church, or ecclesia, the Greek word for church, is missing, the church is missing. Their theology can be reduced to one sentence. Wherever the word church is not listed, the church doesn't exist there. Where the word church is missing, the church is missing. Where the word isn't listed, the church isn't listed. Now, we're going to start looking at that right now. We're going to look at that individually, look at some concepts. First of all, there's a tremendous assumption made that John represents the whole church. To interpret that verse to mean the rapture, you have to say John is a symbolic type of the whole church. Quite frankly, a close examination of Revelation 4.1 doesn't allow for that. There is nothing whatsoever that suggests from the biblical record that they're referring to a rapture here. This verse simply describes the revelation of things to come, and it was given to John in a vision. And the Bible nowhere says, now listen, the Bible nowhere says that John was lifted up into heaven from the earth. It says that he was taken in the spirit. And he was shown things concerning the future state of the church. And nowhere is there ever a rapture mentioned about the future state of the church. John only says he was in the spirit. And he was shown things that would take place after, after the seven churches. It is completely a pure assumption that he was actually caught up to heaven and he was only actually seeing a vision. Furthermore, if he were actually caught up into heaven, it is only an assumption that his being caught up represents the rest of us. Other people were caught up to heaven. How many of you realize Paul the Apostle was caught up to the third heaven? And that is not used to represent a rapture. John was simply taken into the Spirit, and it's interesting what it says. He was taken into the Spirit on the Lord's Day. On the Lord's Day. We're going to look at what that means, on the Lord's Day. He was caught up. He was shown things that was going to take place. And I would challenge anybody to give me a single biblical proof to show outside of their own interpretation and their own presumption and their own assumption that Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 has any biblical support whatsoever that John represents the whole church. You know, whenever you give a type in the Bible, you are required by biblical interpretation to establish that type with Bible verses to prove that's what it means. If you say, for an example, that the number six represents man, you better show why six represents man. If you say water represents the word, you better have verses to show why the water represents the word. If you say the oil represents the Holy Spirit, you better have verses to represent why the oil represents the Holy Spirit. If you say John represents the church, you better have some verses to prove John represents the church, or you're simply interpreting the Bible with personal, private interpretations. There isn't a single biblical proof that John represents the church. This was simply a biblical revelation that John was in exile on Patmos. The Holy Spirit comes to him, says, come up here and I'm going to give you a vision. And when Paul had his vision, remember, he was taken up into the third heaven. Paul said, I don't know whether I was in the body or out. He wasn't sure he was physically in heaven or not. John was clearly said, I was in the spirit. He did not say he was physically caught up. He was just simply in the spirit in the heavenly places. How many of you know that the heavenly places have been open to us? And to equate John as being in heaven and as a type of the church is purely an arbitrary inference to what somebody wants to believe. Now let me further prove what I'm saying. John being taken up into heaven, if that means that we should look for the church in heaven, then we also must realize that John was taken in the same book, in the book of Revelation... John was taken into the wilderness, into Babylon. Are we to assume that the church goes to heaven for a season, and then they got to come back down to Babylon because John's now in Babylon? John, the same book where they're saying John was taken up to heaven, proves that the church is in heaven. The same John that they're using to represent the church going to heaven is the same John that later in the book is represented as being carried in the spirit into the wilderness, into Babylon. 
How come he's no longer in heaven if he represents the church in heaven? You can read that in Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blaspheming, having seven heads and ten horns. And we know that that was har the harlot, the mother of abominations, the mystery of Babylon the Great. Those who clearly assume that this is the rapture must also assume that this church that he represents is now found in Babylon. Furthermore, it is repeatedly revealed in the book of Revelation that John is found back on the earth on a number of occasions. For an example, Revelation 10.1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. If he saw him coming down from heaven, he obviously wasn't up in heaven. And so here John is on the earth. And then it says this. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1. And there was given me a reed like a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship. And he is measuring the temple on the earth. And this temple was going to be trodden under feet of the Gentiles. He clearly wasn't in heaven there. So throughout the book of Revelation we find John back on earth. In Babylon. In the wilderness. Measuring the temple. And also he's back on earth. Seeing an angel come down from heaven. So if he's representing the church being raptured into heaven, why is he back on earth throughout the whole book? Are you following me? Later on in chapter 13, verse 1, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea. Now John, now get this, now John is standing by the seashore and is seeing the Antichrist come out of the sea. If he is representative of the church in heaven, how can he be on the seashore seeing the beast arise? If you take their interpretation, you have to say this. John was there when the Antichrist was revealed. And if John represents the church, taking their own theology, you destroy their own concept. Sometimes he's pictured in heaven, sometimes he's on the earth. You cannot separate the two. Therefore, if he represents the church, then why is he back on earth throughout the whole book of Revelation? He cannot be a representative of the church in heaven. They point out the church isn't specifically mentioned by name. But let me point out to you that the church is not specifically mentioned by name in chapter 19 through 21, which is the rapture, the second coming, and the setting up of Christ's kingdom on earth, and where he comes back with ten thousands of his saints. The word church isn't used there either, except pre-tribulation raptures fail to make mention of that. It's only portrayed in symbolic language, such as the bride. Although the church is never mentioned in connection with any of the earth's scenarios during the tribulation, I would like you to notice, if you read your book of Revelation, that nowhere is the word church used in the heavenly scenarios either. None of them. This interpretation is based exclusively on the fact that the word ecclesia or church isn't found in these chapters. It's taken to mean that the church isn't here because it's never mentioned. They must be removed. I would like to look at that word, Ecclesia. There's a reason why the church isn't mentioned during the tribulation period. The word church is a specific Greek word with a specific Greek meaning. It means the called out ones. It is used 118 times in the New Testament. And 115 times of that 118, it is translated church. Three times, it is translated assembly. It is defined by the Strong's lexicon as... A gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place, an assembly. An assembly of the people convened at the public place of the council for the purpose of deliberating. An assembly of Christians gathered for worship in a religious meeting. Now, the word ecclesia, when it is referring to the church is a word that means literally a public gathering of believers. The called out ones. And if we are going to be facing the greatest tribulation the world has ever known, I have a pretty clear suspicion that we are not going to be having public called out meetings. Just like they don't have public meetings in China today. The church is not functioning as the church in China. It is the saints gathering in secret, not in public gatherings. And the word ecclesia is a specific Greek word meaning a public gathering. And when the tribulation period starts and persecution begins, 
the church always goes underground and begins meeting in secret as it is in all over the world right now. In Saudi Arabia, you cannot have a public worship service. In China, you cannot have a public worship service. In North Korea, you cannot have a public worship service. There is no church, ecclesia, a called out public meeting going on right now in any place in the world where there is severe persecution of the saints of God. Every time there has ever been persecution, the church has gone underground and in the last great time of persecution where the lion, the satanic lion who goes about seeking whom he may devour goes forth knowing that his time is short, you can be sure we are going to be reduced in our ability to gather in public places in many places in the world. Maybe not all, but many. The Second Coming Reexamined is our current broadcast series. Join Pastor Mark Byers now as he sheds more light on this vital topic. I would like to point something else out to you about tribulation, this interpretation that is given, that because the word church isn't found, the church isn't there. If we use that same theology, that same method of interpretation, where the word church isn't found, the church isn't there, therefore in Revelation 4 through 18, the church does not exist on the earth because it's never mentioned. If you ask somebody who believes in the pre-tribulation rapture where the rapture takes place in the book of Revelation, they'll tell you chapter 4. It's interesting that the word church isn't found in Revelation chapter 4 either. And yet that's the verse they used to tell the church was raptured. Using that same method of interpretation, in the visions of heaven that are found in Revelation 21, the word church isn't used. So, is the church not in chapter 19, 20, and 21? No pre-tribulation rapture theologian would say that. If we follow their own argument, we must conclude that since the word church is not found in heaven, the church must not be in heaven, because it's never mentioned in heaven either in the book of Revelation. Nowhere is the word used in the book of Revelation heaven or earth, nor at the end after the rapture or at the second coming or anywhere. The word church isn't used. Does that mean the church doesn't exist in any parts or any of the teaching of the book of Revelation? No pre-tribber would use that theology to interpret the Bible because if they did, it would destroy their own theology. But let me say this to you. Any interpretation of the Bible that you're going to use must be systematic. However you interpret one section of the Bible, you must interpret the rest the same way. If you're going to say, because the word church doesn't exist in that section, it doesn't apply to the church, then you must take that same systematic theological method of interpretation and apply it to everywhere else you study the Bible. Every single place. You can't have a method of interpretation in one place in the Bible and then just simply throw it away and interpret completely differently somewhere else. You will end up having the Bible say anything you want it to say. Now let me say this to you. The word church is not used in over six of the epistles in the New Testament. It is never mentioned in the book of 2 Timothy, Titus, 1 and 2 Peter, 2 John, or Jude. The word ecclesia does not appear in any of those books. Are we to take that same theological method of interpretation and say the word church isn't in those books so they must not apply to us? If you're going to interpret Revelation 4 through 18 that way, you must likewise apply that same method of interpretation to 2 Timothy and Titus and so forth that I've just mentioned. It's very interesting that the word church doesn't appear in Revelation, but the word saints and elect does. I also have a list included in my notes that I, for those who get the notes, if you want them, that includes every place the Greek word translated elect is used. And that word is used all through the New Testament to apply to the church. And it is also used in the book of Revelation to apply to the church. The word saints is used around 50 sometimes in the New Testament. And it always applies almost every time to the church after the cross particularly. And when you come to the book of Revelation, it still applies to the church. But Dr. Walvoord has decided that the word saints doesn't apply to you and me. It doesn't apply to the church. That is an arbitrary division of scripture to divide the word of God to meet a dispensational theological position that is error. 
You can't say the church is not called the saints in the book of Revelation if the church is called the saints anywhere else in the New Testament. If the saints are the saints in the book of Revelation, then the saints are the saints in the book of Corinthians. And if they're the saints in Corinthians, then the saints in Revelation. The saints are the saints. And you can't just arbitrarily say, oh, that doesn't fit my theology. So the saints applies to the Jews. And the elect, of course, that doesn't fit my theology. So the elect is now speaking of the Jews. Let me assure you of something. We've already seen this. The elect has always been the Jews that believe in Jesus and the Gentiles who believe in Jesus. The elect has only been the people who have received the promise of the Messiah, Old or New Testament, prior to the law or after the law, after Christ or before the Christ. Anybody who believed in the Messiah and trusted his work for their salvation was elect. And to say otherwise is a tremendous distortion of the revelation of Scripture. The saints and the elect are not referring to Jews. They're not referring to Israel. They're referring to the Israel of Israel. Remember what I said a few weeks ago. All Israel isn't Israel. The only Israel that has ever been acknowledged by God is those who have Israel, the name of God, the name of Jesus living in them. And we are Israel because we believe in Israel, the name of Jesus. That's one of his names. I would like to point out something to you. That the book of Revelation, as well as Matthew 24, which we're going to look at in detail, both tell us that the book was written to the saints. Revelation 1, 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, who are the Lord's servants? You have to answer that question. If this message was written to the Lord's servants, who are his servants? How many of you realize the New Testament calls us his servants? The church is his servants. So the book was written to his servants, and the New Testament tells us his servants are the church. And then the end of the book of Revelation, he says this, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. He ends the book saying, I have written what I have just written for the churches. Why in the world would he take the time to detail all these events of the tribulation in such clarity and write it to the church that it doesn't even apply to? Why would he give details like he does in Matthew 24 where he is speaking clearly to his disciples having just rebuked Israel, he was, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Matthew 24, and we'll see this clearly in a couple weeks. Matthew 24 is a discourse that took place on the Mount of Olives. And what happened was, in Matthew 23, Jesus is in the temple. You can read this this week for your own information. He was in the temple, and he turns to the Jews, and he begins pronouncing the woes. One woe after another woe after another woe after another woe. And then the last thing he says to them is this, your temple is left unto you desolate and you will see me no more again until you say blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord and it says and Jesus went out who was Jesus he was God in the flesh wasn't he and Jesus turns to their temple and he says to the Jews your temple is now desolate and you will never see me again Till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the next phrase is, and Jesus went out. He went out from where? He left Israel's temple. God left their temple. And after he walks out of the temple, the disciples are really nervous. Because of what he just said to all those leaders. He said it to them all. He, he condemned them all. I mean, read what he says. You brood of vipers. You rotted graves. You hypocrites. That's what he said to them. All the blood of all the righteous men from Abel till now is going to come on you. And your house has left you desolate. You'll not see me again till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus went out. Why did he go out? God abandoned the Jewish temple that day. And he walks out. 
The disciples are nervous. <laughs> and they say, <laughs> look at all this wonderful temple, Jesus. It's like they didn't have anything to say, so they said something stupid. <laughs> you never ever do that? I do that all the time. I'm working at not doing it, but I do it quite often. <laughs> so the disciples are in that kind of a spot, and they're looking around. <laughs> Jesus, look at this beautiful temple. And Jesus said, let me tell you something about this temple. Not one stone is going to be left on another. It's going to be thrown to the ground. Why? Because I've just left it. I don't have any moose for it anymore. The temple that I'm interested in is you, Peter, and you, James, and you, John. You're the temple. And after he said that to them, they really got concerned. They said, when are these things going to be? What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And he begins telling them what's going to happen. He begins exhorting them what's going to take place. As he walks across the Kidron Valley and up on the hill... To the east side of Jerusalem, he gets into the Mount of Olives. And he sits down and begins explaining to them what's going to happen in Matthew 24. And as he's speaking to those disciples, he gives them all these tremendous details of what's going to happen. And he says things like this. I've told you, when you see, see that no one deceives you. After the tribulation of those days, then you will see the sign of the Son of Man. Not one place in that chapter can you find a secret rapture. He's giving tremendous detail about the question, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age, and when is Jerusalem going to be destroyed? And in that chapter where he's giving his details to his disciples, to the founders of the church, he never even mentions a secret rapture. But he's given detail after detail after detail after detail of what they're going to see, what they're going to see, what they're going to see. But he never uses the word church in that chapter. He just tells them what they're going to see. If we use their interpretation, of course, church doesn't apply to anything he said there. You and I both know that's ludicrous. To say that Matthew 24 doesn't apply to the church age has been said by some, but it's nonsense. He gave the details because he wanted them to see it. He wanted to have them to know what to look for. He wanted them to be looking for specifics. And he said, when you see these things, know that your redemption is drawing nigh. Know that the end is near. We're going to look at that chapter in detail, verse by verse, in the next couple of weeks. Even in John's description of heaven in Revelation 21, 22, the word church is not used. But listen to this. If we would simply believe what John wrote, we would know that that theology is false. Listen to what John says. Revelation 8, 34. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints. There's the church. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God and out of the angel's hand. So we have saints praying. Let me ask you a question. Why are saints praying if they're all in heaven? What are they praying about in heaven? Why are they asking God to do anything for them in heaven? Of course, because Mr. Walvoord says the saints are the Jews. Well, let's see if Revelation holds that theology up. Revelation 13, 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given over him all kindreds and tongues and nations. The saints there he applies to, again, the Jews. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith. Of the saints. Oh, that's still the Jews. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they. Now, are you ready for this? This is the word saints in the book of Revelation. The same word that's been used over and over. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's not talking about Jews, I assure you. It's talking about God's people, the saints, that believe in Jesus. And I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So in the book of Revelation, over and over, the saints are referring to martyrs for Jesus that keep the commandments of Jesus, that love the Lord Jesus, who are willing to die for Jesus. As the book, the whole New Testament, uses the word saints to refer to the church. Revelation 18, 24, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints 
and of all that were slain upon the earth. Revelation 29, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and encompassed the camp of the saints about. Do you know when that is? That is in Gog and Magog. How many of you realize that in Gog and Magog, the body of Christ and all the people of God gathered with Jesus are going to be attacked by Satan and his deceived followers that he is able to deceive at the end of the millennium. And here it says they come against all the saints. Isn't the church included in that company as well? If you say that, again, you've gone into utter nonsense. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. Some of you may say, well, why are you teaching us all this? I guarantee you why is because if you even suggest to somebody that you don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, they're going to hit you with these seven inferences and you need to have an answer. And quite frankly, dear ones, we have a body of Christ out there who is not ready for what is about to take place on the face of the earth. We're not ready. The church is not ready. And if you understand we're going through the tribulation, you have a responsibility to share it and share it effectively and give people hope that is not based on a lie. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. That's Revelation 1. Even pre-tribulation rapture teachers will say that's talking about the church. But read Revelation 5 with me for a moment where the church is supposedly never mentioned. Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 to 10, is a very parallel passage to the one we just read. And when he had taken the book, and the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people and nation, and has made us kings and priests unto our God, and we shall reign on the earth. According to Mr. Walvoord and company, that does not apply to the church. How can Revelation 1, 5 and 6 apply to the church when Revelation 5, 8 to 10 doesn't apply when it is calling us kings and priests unto our God and it refers to being washed in the blood of the Lord out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, people, and nation. If that isn't the church, I don't know what the church is then. Clearly, I don't know what the church is. There is the church in chapter 5. Also, you can look this up, Revelation 2, 26 and 27. The promise that we shall reign on the earth the promise that we shall reign on the earth that is found in chapter 5, verse 10, is also given to the church in Revelation 2, 26 and 27. Therefore, the idea that the church being absent from the book of Revelation, the word ecclesia, proves that the church doesn't exist there, is simply not credible, nor does it hold up against the acid test of Scripture. Now, I want to move quickly into something else. The third, the emphasis on comfort and encouragement. I won't spend as much time here but the emphasis on comfort and encouragement. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4. This is the most clear biblical teaching on the rapture there is. What is said here is what real comfort can there be from the pre-tribulation rapture, folks? It is said this. What real comfort can there be in this section of Scripture, if believers have to suffer the terrible things of the tribulation prior to the second coming. In other words, if the rapture doesn't take place before the events of Revelation 4 through 18, tell me what comfort can there be that there's going to be a rapture? There's no comforting thought to that. The only real comfort is that if we're out of here, real comfort there. And I, I would agree with that concept in the sense that if we were taken out and didn't face those things, I suppose that would be rather comforting. However, I wouldn't take much comfort in it because if my God can't conquer in the midst of the worst days on earth, he's a failure. If he can't lead his church through the greatest tribulation that's ever hit the earth, and he cannot have saints overcome in the midst of it, he doesn't have much of a church. If I were him, I wouldn't want my wife so weak that the slightest thing causes me to deny Christ. And let me say this to you. We think we're so ready for the second coming. In the body of Christ at large, we're so ready. We're out of here. When Jesus comes, we're going out. A couple weeks ago, I said, get up and move over to the other side of the congregation. 
And I know that there were those of you that never said anything, but it was bugging you that I was telling you to move from one side of the congregation to the other for no reason. We can't even swap seats in a congregational meeting without getting peeved. And I've been a pastor now for over 30 years. And furthermore, my wife's been in the ministry since she was born. Her father was a pastor. Her grandfather was a pastor for 60-some years. We know a little bit about church life. My three brothers have been pastors. We know a little bit about church life. And I am astonished at what causes people to get offended and leave churches. The smallest, little, stupid, insignificant thing. And they're out of there. I've said to my wife many times, it's amazing to me to watch Christians strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. Some little thing happens in the church and they're out of there. And then they'll go to a church and swallow wickedness. I know people who have left churches, godly churches, and gone to churches where the pastor's children were committing adultery and fornication. And they could overlook that. But they couldn't overlook some silly little offense at the church they were in. And we think we're ready for the rapture. We're ready for Jesus. We're, we're a church that's without spot or wrinkle and we are fully dedicated to Jesus. It's amazing to watch Christians throw out the towel over the silliest little thing. We're not ready for the Lord. We need a tribulation to sort out the wheat and the tares. The people that don't want to hear that are the ones who are the tares. The ones who aren't tares are saying, I just want to be the finest of wheat and if I have to be ground to powder to be the finest of wheat for my Lord, I'm willing to be ground to powder. I want you all to know something. I go about mourning all the day long. When I was a young man, I was very frivolous and foolish. I was so silly that my wife was hesitant to marry me. I was a goof-off. I used to go hunting in my suits between classes in Bible college. I do silly things, just silly things. I remember sitting in Bible school class with a squirt gun in the middle of class, squirting the guy behind me under my arm. I mean, that's the kind of things I do. I got married in, in 1977. My wife's roommate, who had, was from India, came to visit the U.S. and stopped by our house. Seven short years after, she came to my wife and she said, My, Mark has sobered. Just seven years of working in the body and I sobered. It's been 30 years now. 33. And now I go about mourning all day long. Inside crying and weeping and groaning. Because I know what is ahead. And the body of Christ isn't ready. And when it's happened around the world in other countries, the chaff was driven away. And the church was reduced to pure wheat. And I look around the nation, I was just, it was an interesting thing. I called a man on the phone for a business thing, and I didn't even know where he was at because it was a large company. Come to find out he was in another state completely hundreds and hundreds of miles from here. He happens to attend the church of a man that I'm aware of and know. I'm personally aware of the kind of things that have gone on in his church. I know quite a bit about that man's church. I thought he had a church of about a thousand. And so I said, oh, you attend that church? Yeah. So so and so's your pastor? Oh, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, I know about him. He says, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, we have a wonderful church. We have 15,000 people. I said, oh, that's nice. They've got 15,000 people. But one of their pastors was committing adultery with the women in the church. And I know it because I know the pastor that did it. And we can look at them and say, we're not, they're not ready. Listen, brothers and sisters, we're not ready. We are not ready for the coming of the Lord. And that's why Jesus would say, will I even find faith when I come? Why would he even say such a thing? If we're all so ready. The church of Jesus Christ is backsliding right in front of my eyes. And I've watched it grow more and more worldly and more and more ungodly. And the pressures are coming in on us. And we're succumbing to things. The Lord is saying, I've got to do something to get my bride ready. But 
the average Christian is to say, I'm out of here. I'm gone. You can stay if you want. Let me tell you something, honey. You aren't deciding whether you go or stay. The Lord is. And you may believe a lie all you want. But if God has decided there isn't a pre-tribulation secret rapture, you aren't going whether you believe it with all your heart or not. I don't care how sincere you are. And quite frankly, if I'm wrong, on the way up, meet me and I'll say, hey, I was wrong. <laughs> what do you know? I'm wrong. I, for the 999,000th time, I'm wrong. Praise God I was wrong about this. But if you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture and you're wrong, you're in a different ballpark. In fact, you're in big trouble because you are not prepared. You're not forewarned. Your emotions aren't ready. You're thinking you're out of here. You'll even consider denying Christ because you don't believe that he's faithful. You'll even be deceived by the Antichrist possibly because you won't believe it is the Antichrist. Oh, this can't be the Antichrist. I'm out of here. Really? I'm going to show you from Scripture that's not true. Thank you for listening to Kingdom Living, sponsored by Calvary Christian Church in Royal Oak, Michigan.